Have you heard God promises his presence? In this lesson, we will learn that God will bring renewal. Happy Sunday. Are you missing your Sunday school? Would you like to be a part of our Sunday school? Then subscribe, like, comment, and ring the bell, and you'll be notified every time I post a new video on our Sunday school lesson. Uh, if you all would like for me to do another giveaway, just post, put the word giveaway below this video so I'll know. Hi, I'm Regina Reed, and I teach Sunday school at Antioch Missionary Baptist Church in Maple, Mississippi. Now, let's get into this lesson. God promises his presence. Devotional reading is Exodus 33rd chapter, verses 12 through 23. Background scripture is Joel 1, 1 through 4. And then the second chapter, verse 18 through 31. And then the key verse is Joel chapter 2, verse 27. Today's date is January 29th, 2023. Lesson aims. List elements of cause and effect. Number two, compare and contrast the positive and negative imperatives in today's text. And three, express confident assurance of God's presence in your now. Let's start with the prayer. Heavenly Father, we trust that you will bring restoration to our world despite our sinful actions and inactions. Renew us so that we might better follow and praise you. Show us how to live as your people, free from shame. In Jesus' name, amen. Introduction. Rebuilding after loss in 1874, grasshoppers swarmed through parts of the Great Plains of North America and laid waste to crops, wood, paper, and even people's clothes. These kinds of insects measure no more than one and one half inch long. But when numbered in, in the billions, they have the potential to destroy thousands of acres of crops. The result of the destruction was total. People reported that land appeared as if it had been ravaged by wildfire. Immigrants to Kansas were among the hardest hit by the swarms. People's livelihoods depended on bountiful crops, but the crops had been devoured and were no more. The renewal of the land and the restoration of the people took years and required assistance from the entire nation. A natural disaster of this level feels foreign for modern readers who have never experienced it. However, many people in today's world still suffer hardships because of destructive plagues of insects. The people of Judah and the prophet Joel could report on this type of destruction firsthand. Both the people and their land needed wondrous and miraculous renewal. Lesson Context Several uncertainties surround the composition of the book of Joel. The book opens by stating that what follows is, The word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Penthuel, beyond the prophet's name and the name of his father. Other personal details regard, regarding this specific Joel are unavailable to us. If Joel wrote in this context, then he was lamenting, what had happened to Jerusalem and held hope for God's vengeance against foreign aggressors. Some details behind the composition of the book of Joel may never be discovered. The fact should not dissuade modern readers from taking seriously the prophet's warnings and promises. Joel directed his prophetic message to the people of Judah and the city of Jerusalem. The book opens by describing a plague of insects that destroyed the crops of Judah. The once turmoil of the land and the suffering of its people. Though the people had sinned, he had compassion for them. The Lord was jealous for his land and showed pity for his people. He demonstrated his care by promising his people renewed sustenance and protection from foreign enemies. His renewal would cause his people and their land to prosper. Because of his compassion, his greatest, his greatness, would be on display for his people and the whole world. Lesson Scriptures Joel, the second chapter, verses 21 through 27. Verse 21 Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. The command to fear not appears at least 50 times in the Old Testament, and we talked about this in several lessons. Joel contrasts the fear of God's judgment and the joy of God's intervention. 
On the day of the Lord, sin will bring judgment, and only God's forgiveness will bring rejoicing. Unless you repent, your sin will result in punishment. Let God intervene in your life. Then you will be able to rejoice in the day because you will have nothing to fear. Before there were fasting, plagues, and funeral diaries, then there will be feasting, harvesting, and songs of praise. When God rules, his restoration will be complete. In the meantime, we must remember that God does not promise that all his followers will be prosperous now. When God pardons, he restores our relationship with him, but this does not guarantee individual wealth. Instead, God promises to meet the deepest needs of those who love him by loving us, forgiving us, giving us purpose in life, and giving us a caring Christian community. Verse 22. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the fields, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Joel described how the beasts of the field groan and cry because of the destruction of their habitats. Fire, drought, and swarms of insects had destroyed the land. The pastures and the fields were laid waste. The land was uninhabitable for all of creation. However, the Lord's great work of restoration would come to the creatures of the land. They had no reason to fear. The Lord's restoration of the wilderness reflects the connectedness among God's creation. Only a fruitful land could sustain animals, livestock, and humans. Centuries later, Jesus taught that God provides for all of his creation, even the smallest animals. Verse 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Zion is another name for the city of Jerusalem. Because the Lord's restoration, the people would experience joy and gladness, feelings that were lost because of the turmoil. The Lord God, who seemed absent during disaster, would deliver his people and be present with them as their true king. The underlying Hebrew word translated moderately is translated elsewhere as righteousness or justice. God showed justice to his people by allowing the return of the rains, thus bringing an end to the drought. When the people returned to God, his justice would be fulfilled and he would show compassion. Former rain came to the late fall season during the month of Tishra, also known as Ethanim and it helped soften the ground for sowing new crops. Latter rains fell during Nisan, the first month of Israel's religious calendar, corresponding to parts of March and April. This springtime rain brought necessary moisture to the ground prior to the harvest season. The land would return to the natural cycle of rainy and dry seasons and would experience no more drought. What is in view here is a drought that came as a result of the people's failure to follow God. The drought resulted in famine, which was also a consequence of the people's failure to follow God. By promising a return to consistent rainy season, God showed that he is faithful to care for his people and their land. Verse 24. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. Rather than experience famine, the people would see tangible examples of the Lord's blessing. A person would separate the unusable grain from husk and chaff at threshing floors. Grains like wheat and seed, like corn, supplied the people with the means of sustenance. The land's restoration would be evident as the people contrasted previously wasted fields. With threshing floors full of wheat, the fats elsewhere speak of presses for wine. The first step in the creation of both oil, of both olive oil and wine, was to crush the fruit by a press or underfoot. The presses would overflow because of the bountiful harvest. No longer would God's people have to live hand to mouth. Malachi prophesied of a similar blessing as God promised to pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. That's Malachi the third chapter in the tenth verse. Wine and oil were an important part of the everyday life of God's people. The two liquids were used for offerings to the indicated offering 
to and indicated the presence of his blessing. The goodness of the Lord was displayed for his people through wine, oil, and wheat. Verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Joel's prophecy began by describing the land's destruction by several types of insects. The ancient Near East, as in the current day, invasive insects could number two in the billions as they swarm came on a particular land. These swarms would spoil the land by eating the entirety of a land's vegetation before swarming elsewhere. Complete destruction followed these swarms. Vines destroyed, vegetation ruined, tree bark stripped. As a result, the people living in these lands frequently experienced famine. A great army, Joel described two major invasions, destructive insects and foreign armies. Scripture is unclear regarding the exact identity of the foreign invader, the northern army. Joel describes God's warning of Petiri, Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestine. Along the Egypt and Edom, these nations received a warning because of their actions toward Judah. Although Joel portrayed two destructive forces, insects and humans, these may very well be two descriptions of the same locust plague. People could rejoice because God had not disregarded their suffering. For God to renew the land and the people involved the people receiving restitution for the years that they had lost. God did no wrongdoing. The people were experiencing the consequences of their sins. Verse 26. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. The famine would be reversed. A time of celebration would follow as the people gathered to eat in plenty and be satisfied. The atmosphere would be like that of celebration following a successful harvest season. The people would gather to praise the name of the Lord who provided the harvest. The restoration followed God's history of working wondrously for his people. Though the people experienced harsh and dehumanizing treatment while living as slaves in Egypt, God dealt miraculously with the Egyptians to free the people. In the Old Testament era, to be ashamed had a communal dimension. Shame was not merely an individual feeling of inadequacy or worthlessness. Instead, it was a social state in which the group of people was considered by others as lacking honor or dignity. Famine, drought, and infertile crops were shameful occurrences and were frequently the result of covenant disobedience. Further, shame had a spiritual component. Prophets warned that shame would be experienced by those who practiced idolatry and opposed God and his word. Verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. At the center of the relationship between God and the people was the reality that God was present and active in their midst. When their suffering was reversed, they saw the renewal of their land. They would know that God was present as he promised. None else could rightly claim Israel's allegiance and worship. God's presence with his people led to their rejoicing in his mercies. The people were to live without fear and being ashamed because the king of Israel was in their midst. Conclusion a plague of destructive insects with accompanying feelings of terror, like the one described in this lesson text, might be incomprehensible to modern audiences. Therefore, the feeling of joy from God's promised renewal might seem equal to foreign. However, modern audiences of Joel's prophecy can take away two applications. First, the text serves as an ancient reminder regarding a present reality. The importance of maintaining hope during seasons of suffering, Joel's words directed to a people in the midst of hardship, reorienting their expectations, disaster and shame changed to flourishing and celebration, all because of God's great work of renewal. 
Joel promised the people that hope was possible in the midst of disaster and suffering. Although sin brings consequences, as it did for the people of Judah, God will not ignore or disregard his people. Instead, God can bring joy to replace sorrow. His timetable may not be ours, and he may not immediately bring joy or fix our suffering. However, his people can take comfort in knowing his presence. Second, this passage serves as a reminder of God's promises to renew all creation. Joel promised that not only would the people be restored, but creation, the land and creation, the land and the animals would also be restored. God's plan of restoration is not only focused on the spiritual realm, but also the physical realm. All things spiritual and physical belong to the God who created them. Joel calls us to embrace all aspects of God's restoration and renewal. As a result, God's people of all era can celebrate his presence in their midst. And thought to remember, God's people need not be ashamed. He brings renewal. And if you have enjoyed this lesson, give us a thumbs up. Share this lesson. Get prepared for that giveaway of you all so you want one. Get your shots. Stay six feet apart. Love each other. Pray for each other. And I will see you all. I'll see you all next week.